green. It's green. <laughs> All right. Morning. Morning. Yeah, people are here. So everyone's done with assignment two. How many people are done with assignment two? All right, cool. Assignment three coming out today. Very exciting. Um, so today, file. I wish I had a guest in class every day. You know, like John Stewart. I wish I could be like on today's show. We have a guest, a special guest. Um, I don't know who that person would be, though. We could have a file system person, right? Like our, um, all right, so today we're, we're going to talk about caching, right? Last week we talked about file systems, and what I realized as I was getting toward the end of this is that caching and consistency kind of make nice friends together. Uh, part of it is they both start with the letter C, um, but they also have, you know, caching has implications for consistency, and uh, then we're going to talk about journaling as a specific approach to providing consistency in the face of uh, caching and disk latencies, right? And also just, you know, failures which can happen at any time, okay? So, a couple of announcements. Assignment 2 is due today, midnight. Um, you guys have five late days, okay? And let me uh, explain how the late days are going to work. Right, because uh, maybe this isn't wasn't clear, and I think it's a little different than than maybe how some other classes work. So, um, one of the things I don't want to happen is I don't want you guys to take late days on assignment two and have those late days kind of come back to haunt you for assignment three. Right. So this is how it will work. Assignment three is tentatively due the last midnight on the last Friday night of the last week of the semester. If you take five days from there you get to midnight of the last day of reading period, so the last day before exams. I think that technically that's the latest that I can let the assignments go, okay? So what will happen is if you take a late day on assignment two or two late days on assignment two, that will push back your due date for assignment three for two days. So you will have the same amount of time for assignment three regardless of how many late days you take for assignment two, right? So my suggestion is uh, unless you want to finish the class early, which is a completely laudable goal, uh, you know, use your late days. There's no penalty for, for, uh, for using them, right? But does that, does that make sense to people? So if you take a late day, currently the assignment three is due on Friday. If you take one late day on assignment two, then your assignment three will be due Saturday. Does that make sense to people? All right. And then you'll still have those four late days that you can take on assignment three as well, right? Jason. This will be up on the website, so that's a feature we're going to add today, right? So the idea will be uh, when you go to resubmit a patch, uh, the website will tell you if you submit a patch at this time, you will have this many late days remain, right? And that'll be up to you. So, so don't mess that up, right? Like don't upload something again. Um, you know, and, and these deadlines are hard, right? Like this isn't me, this is the computer, right? So if the computer thinks that the time is after 11.59 p.m. tonight, it's going to charge you a late day, right? And, you know, that's just how it's going to be. So, you know, the, the website may get a little backed up at that point, so maybe it's good to start submitting like 11.55 or something, right? Or maybe 11.50 or 11.45, right? Um, you know, if, if, those, if those 10 minutes, if you really think those 10 minutes are going to make a huge difference in your, your performance on assignment two, my suggestion is take a late day, right? And take a late day and make sure that whatever it is that you're trying to finish up really works, all right? All right. So last week was file system week, or week two of file systems, I guess. Questions about file systems, right? So I want to go back to kind of doing a general review on Monday. I know the weekend was long. I'm sure lots of exciting things happened. Uh, and so, you know, some of the brain cells that you were storing that information in have potentially expired, right? So uh, any questions about file systems generally, right, before we do just a little bit of review? All right, so who remembers what the design goals for file systems were? Let me start over here in this corner of the room with, with, with this group, Keith, Alex, any? Do you work? But that's too bad because this was actually covered last Monday. So that's not a good excuse for your file system design goals. Good try, though. <laughs> right, right, right. I've got to be able to find files, so I need to translate file names to file contents. That's good. Keith, do you, do you, do you remember Monday, last Monday, a long time ago? You were one week younger. It was warmer, I think. 
Nothing. Let's see. This is oh man. This this kind of the room. Maybe I've chased people over to this side. Okay. I'm going to start standing over here more. It can cause a migration back in that direction. Let's see. Who should I pick on today? Scott. To single files, right? So I think there's something in the middle. So I need to. So the second thing is I need to support the file interface. I have to allow the files to grow, shrink, change, move, etc. Right? Uh, yes. Optimize access to single files, and then along those same lines, dodging. Okay. Be efficient with memory. That's that's a potential design goal. It's not the one that I'm looking for. What's what? Who who can do a one word modification of design goal three? to get in the next design goal. Jason, I think I heard you mumbling. Multiple files. Multiple files, right? So if there are files that are related, I want to optimize access to those files, right? So today, my goal is to get through caching. Tomorrow, I want to talk about FFS. Finally, I know that I've been hinting that we're going to talk about FFS for a long time, but I want to actually go through a couple of file system case studies to kind of close out our file system unit. So we'll do FFS on Wednesday and on Friday, we will do LFS, a log structured file system, which is kind of a fun take on file system design, something fairly, fairly different, right? And, and debatable, something that caused a lot, of, uh, a lot of debate within the file system community, right? And then finally, particularly pertinent for today, surviving failures, right? So maintaining consistency in uh, the light of, you know, people tripping over the cord, you know, uh, maybe sectors failing on the, on the disk, right? So essentially trying to survive failures, particularly sort of power down kind of failures, right? Where the machine does not shut down cleanly, right? This is kind of a critical goal, all right? Questions about file system goals, design goals, right? Okay, so let's say I want to actually perform a write. So now we're kind of getting into Wednesday, right? What do, what do I have to do, right? Who, who can, who can, uh, who can remind me how, I'm, how I need to do this? Malik. So I need to locate an empty disk block, right? I need to mark those as in use. OK, what's the next thing I need to do? Calvin, do you remember? He does not. Who wants to help him out? Front of the room. Sean, Michael, Michael, Carl. What's that? Got to associate them with the file, right? So I've got to you know, link them in somehow. And we talked on Friday about multiple different ways of associating data blocks with the file, which I'll ask you about in a second. What's the next thing I need to do? Adjust the size of the file. So that probably, yeah, that probably means updating some information in the inode, right? Along with the data blocks associating them, which might mean updating the inode or some sort of index structure, right? And then finally, what do I need to do? Write the data, right? And you know, the implications for consistency are that from the perspective of a process, all these things need to look like they happen together, right? But perspective of the disk, these are potentially multiple modifications to different parts of the disk, different disk blocks, right? And depending on when a failure happens, I could have all sorts of problems, right? Which we'll talk about in more detail today. All right. Finally, so rewrite, right? Who who remembers? So rewrite are essentially the goal of the file system is translating the offset into a data block. I need to find the data block associated with a particular offset of the file. We talked on Friday about three ways of doing this. Who can give me the first one we talked about? How do I associate data blocks with a file? Scott. Linked list, starting at the inode, right? So the inode contains a pointer to the first block, and then the blocks contain pointers to the next block, et cetera. OK, so that's one way. What's another way? An array, flat array. And the third way, the more, a little bit nicer, cleverer way that we talked about? A multi-level index, right? And we talked a little bit about the pros and cons of these, which I will not get into in the interest of time. OK. So brief overview, kind of jogging your memory about the stuff that we covered last week. Questions on this material before we go on? All right. It's a slow crowd again today. That's good. All right. So, you know, we, we got into this a little bit, so we're just, this is also going to be a little bit of review, right? Canonical way operating systems make a slow thing look faster. What do we do? Cache. Use a cache, right? So we take a smaller, faster thing, usually with different properties, and we put it in front of the big slow thing, 
right? And that's intended to make the big slow thing look faster by exploiting properties of the small fast, right? In the file system, we're using memory, right? And so memory has these nice properties. It's very fast to access. What's the problem here for consistency sake? What is the difference? What's the main difference between memory and disk? Why do we have both? Disk is persistent, memory is not, right? So caching has some serious implications for consistency, right? We talked about how operating systems use memory both as memory, right, to hold, you know, data in a process address space, and also to cache file data, right? So this is the canonical case where I have a portion of the system memory that's being used for the file cache and a portion that's being used for actual pages and process address spaces, and balancing those is something that the, the operating system is kind of doing continuously to try to maintain good performance, right? These are competitive uses of memory, obviously. The more I use for the buffer cache, the less I have to use as main system memory, okay? So who remembers? Big buffer cache, small main memory, what, what happens here? What, what, uh, so so here's, here's one question. When, let me turn this around. When would this be a good thing? When would this be the thing that I want? When would I want to have the buffer cache op, you know, taking up most of the memory? Yeah, Ben. Um, say your machine is just serving up an NFS server. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe I'm running something like an NFS server, right? That, that's, that's caching file contents in a, in a huge chunk of memory. And the, the server itself is fairly simple, and so it doesn't need a lot of, of, of data in, in memory. And it's a single application machine, right? Another uh, case where this would probably happen would be with a database, right? A database would probably want to map or cache massive parts of the files that where it actually stores its persistent data, right? And if I had the database running as the only thing on the machine, eventually over time I might see the buffer cache get really huge, without there being much memory in use by the application or applications, right? But what, what sort of problems could this cause? Let's say I have a, a different, uh, maybe more typical scenario. What, what would, what's the worry here about performance? What could happen? Swapping. Swapping, right? So if I drain so much memory out of the memory pool that the processes are going to disk constantly to, uh, because of page faults, then I can produce thrashing in the memory subsystem and this could be bad, right? Okay, opposite case. Small buffer cache, large main memory. So, so again, when would this be, a, when could this be potentially a good thing? Well, when I'm not using much disk, and, and, and what's, what, what, what can you, can you come up with an application that might not use files that much? Carl? Maybe like Yeah, some big computation. It might, read a little bit of data from a file, start some massive computation that sprawls all over memory, and then just like write a small result, right? So some, some big computation intensive thing might not actually use the file system that much while it's running, right? So it might be okay to trim the buffer cache quite aggressively in order to provide it with a huge chunk of its address space that it can use efficiently, right? But if this gets, if the buffer cache gets too small, then I, I lose out on swapping, but my file access is extremely slow. So anything that's dependent on I.O. is, is going to start to slow down, right? So it turns, I mean, I was thinking about this, and it turns out I don't really know what sort of uh, algorithms or heuristics modern systems use to tune this balance, right? And I, I would love to find out. I'm sure there's been some sophisticated uh, approaches into figuring out sort of where, you know, where do I, how do I draw this balance to essentially, what, what, what am I essentially trying to do here? What's the overall goal, right? What's the overall goal? I'm trying to find some balance between the buffer cache and main memory that reduces what? To what? To the disk, right? Uh, on some, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a perfect analogy because throughput can depend on other things. But on some level, you can, you can see this as trying to find this balance to reduce disk access because the disk is just so terribly slow, right? And if I can find a place where I have enough memory that I'm not swapping that hard and I have enough memory in the buffer cache that I'm not hitting the file system that hard, then, then I'm in a good place, right? So this is kind of the overall goal, all right? And on Linux, we talked about how there's a swappiness parameter that has a fantastic name, uh, and, and in my, like, as far as I can tell, is a little bit mysterious as far as how it actually operates. Right. Okay. 
So the last thing we got to just briefly was, was a discussion of kind of where, where are we going to put the buffer cache, right? So what were my two options, right? So, so here's this, this canonical view of, of kind of what the file system looks like from the perspective of the operating system. I have the uh, file system interface that's provided two processes, right? This is the system call file interface, open, close, read, write, dupe, whatever, right? Um, those calls, in some way or another, depending on the operating system I'm running on, have to get actually mapped down to a concrete implementation, right? And this is usually done in a flexible way because I want to allow myself to support multiple file systems, right? If I baked this into the system and I coupled these two together, then I would essentially only be able to support one file system. Right, so I would ship Linux, and it'd be like, if you don't like ext4, it's like when Henry Ford made the, you know, the first Model Ts. Right, you know, you can have any file system you want as long as it's ext4. Right, um, so so and, and that would would not be great. Right, um, and then. So these guys, you know, have their own implementation and, you know, they do their own things and, and they arrange things differently on disk, but fundamentally the disk interface is the same, right? So what are these guys doing? They're, they're doing all sorts of complicated logic in here and accessing their own data structures, but from the perspective of the operating system, what they're doing is they're making read and write block requests to the disk, right? Disk interface is very, very simple, very thin. So where are the two places that I can put my file system buffer cache? Where are the two places I can sneak in here to make sure I'm on every file path? So I can put it on the bottom. I can put it on top of the disk. Where's the other place I can put it? So I could put it up here, right? And so I could put, I could put a buffer cache essentially below or right above the virtual file system layer. Or I could put it down here and I could put it on, above the disk, okay? And I think we, we got into the implications of this. So if I'm above the file system, right, if I'm up here, what objects am I caching conceptually? What objects am I caching? Files, right? I mean, the operations that I'm seeing are operations that are on files, right? Open, close, read, right? These are file level operations. They operate on files or the file abstraction, right? Okay. So I'm caching files and, and directories, which are, you know, of course, just files, right? The buffer cache inter interface is what? What's the interface that the buffer cache has to support? The file interface, right? The file system file interface. Open, close, read, write, whatever, right? These are the calls that the buffer cache is going to see, and it's going to, rather than going to disk, try to return contents from memory. That's the goal of the buffer cache, right? The buffer cache is, is supposed to avoid going to disk when possible. Okay, and so how, do, how does this actually work, right? So how, if I'm at the, in the buffer cache and I'm implemented above the file system, how do I perform an open? What do I need to do to open a file? Okay, so I'm going to look in the buffer, but on, let's say this file hasn't been opened before. What do I need to do? Can I perform this operation in the cache? No. I need to just pass this down to the underlying file system because I don't, again, I mean, the file's new to me too, right? I need a file to operate on and open is what creates a file, right? So the, the buffer cache, unless the file's already open, in which case I can return the contents that I have, but if it's a new file, I just need to tell the, the underlying file system, hey, open this file, right? Because it's the one that un understands how to do name translation and all these things, right? What about read? Right, so so far, so far I'm struggling, right? Like the only thing I've done is pass the call through to the file system I'm supposed to be caching stuff for, right? So can, can I do better with read? How does read work? So, right, I mean, here, here's when I actually start to be able to cache things, okay? I look in the buffer cache. If it's not there, then I need to pass it down to the underlying file system so that the contents can be loaded, right? If it is in the cache, then I just return the contents I have, right? This is the idea of a cache. What about write? What about write? How is write a little bit different than read? John? You should be able to just write straight to the cache. So I can write to the cache if what? If the file is already open. If the file is in the cache, right? And how do I get the file contents into the cache? So I probably need to do something like a read. Right? I need to get the contents into the cache, and then I can modify them in the cache. Right? This probably, you know, r remember, the file system interface allows you to write one byte. Right? 
So you know, in order in order to actually do that properly, I probably need to load you know a whole disk block potentially. Okay, so. So essentially, at the file time in the buffer cache, I'm going to load the contents in the buffer cache, and then I can modify them. If the file is in the cache, then I modify the cache contents, right? And I'm done. Easy. OK? What about close? What do I need to do on close? Can I just, so on close, I just throw the file out of the cache. No problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I better make sure I flush the contents through the file system if the file is dirty, right? So if a write has taken place to the file, I better make sure the file system actually knows about those contents, because otherwise, the next time I do a read, I'm going to get the contents on disk. And the contents on disk won't reflect the modifications the process has made. OK? Questions about this? Right? This is kind of, we haven't really talked about how to do a cache. I guess I, I kind of thought we had, because we talked about the TLB, but the TLB is a little different. Right? So does this make sense, conceptually? All right, we'll, we'll walk through another example when we talk about disk blocks. Uh, although maybe we won't. I can't remember if it's in here or not. OK, so what are the pros to putting the file system above the, you know, what, 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 is, sorry, what, is the, what are the pros of putting the buffer cache above the file system, right, I, and having it support the file system interface, right? Remember, we're comparing this against putting it at a lower level and having it cache disk blocks, right? So what's, what's one pro here? What's that? So I see file objects, right? Why, why is that? So, so if I'm, let's say I'm down at the, 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 the disk block interface, right? Do I have any idea? And it says, oh, do a read to block 32. Do I know anything what's about what that block is? Or what its contents mean, or what they are? No, I have no semantic information, right? So the nice thing is, I, I see file level operations, right? So for example, if, if someone does a read from a file, I might be able to actually, you know, what we talked about is I, I can load the entire file, right? Because I know that it's a read to this file, and I can ask the file system to actually read the entire file, maybe, rather than just the contents that the uh, process asked for, meaning that now I have everything in the cache and further reads, if I'm expecting there to be further reads, will hit the cache, right? What are the cons? Particularly when it regards to consistency. What, 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 what's, what's, what's the biggest problem with this approach? Anybody? Any ideas? The biggest problem here is that I'm hiding file operations from the file system. Right? So these, these calls to things like read and write are not actually, some of them are not going to the file system, right? The file system never sees it. Okay? So now what I've, especially with write, read, eh, who cares, right? Reads are on some level very different than writes because they're, non -mo they're not modifying uh, anything on disk, okay? But because I'm hiding these file operations, the, the file system can't actually do any consistency checking. And, and you know, if I do a write, to two different files on two different file systems, things that get updated on disk might be very different, right? And, and the, the file system may want, for example, for consistency reasons, to flush certain things to disk at regular intervals. We'll talk a little bit about this today. So this is the biggest problem with this approach, and I think that's why it's not really used, right? What's another, what's another potential problem here? What kind of data can I not cache? What kind of data won't be in my cache? What's that? What's that? Where on disk it's going? Well, I don't know about that. What? So remember, we divided the on disk. We divided blocks on disk into two groups, right? There were data blocks that stored file contents, and then what's the rest of the disk being used for? Metadata, right? The block bitmaps, inode bitmaps, inode tables, super block, all that stuff. Is that stuff going to be cached? No. Right? It's not a file. It's never actually read and written as a file. It's updated by the file system by modifying disk blocks, but it's never going to be in my cache. Right? And, and so finally, what's the problem with not caching those blocks? They're, they're, they could be really hot. Right? They might be really hot blocks. Hot blocks. Sounds like a, like a hot stone massage or something. Right? They, could, they could be very hot blocks, right? meaning that you know, every inode operation might have to hit the inode table, right? Every time I access a data block, I have to update the, uh, the block bitmap, right? So these get hit a lot. And if they're not in the cache, and they're always having to be done at the disk level, then that could be kind of terrible, right? 
All right. So let's talk about below the file system. So let me back a little bit. Right? Okay, so now we're down here, right? So now we said, okay, putting this up here is, is a little problematic. We're hiding information from the file system. There's a lot of things we can't cache. So let's go below. What do we cache? What is the cache? What, what, are, the, what are the objects in the cache? They're disk blocks, right? They're just disk blocks. 4K disk blocks. That's nice, right? We like that. Something nice and consistent about it, okay? What's the buffer cache interface? Read block, write block. It's the disk level interface, right? You know, read this block with some block ID, write this block, right? We're, we're like, we're literally, we're just, op we're just telling the, you know, we're passing these commands straight through to the disk, right? So the disk doesn't know about files, it doesn't know about super blocks, I know tables, whatever. The disk just knows, here's an address, and I know where to seek to to get that block, okay? So, pros to going below, right? What can I do below the file system that I couldn't do? Some of these are, as you might expect, just the inverse of the cons of the other approach. So now I can cache everything, right? Anything that the file system is using, any block that is read or written, I can cache, right? And so I can cache the super block, I can cache inode tables, whatever, right? This is great, okay? What's another pro? So, okay, it's independent of the file system. It also allows the file system more control, right? Because the file system code is actually being called on every file operation, right? So every call through the file system interface will be processed by the file system, right? And so, for example, and, and usually caches provide ways for the file system to force things to disk, right? That, so when, when I had the cache above the file system, there were, let's say I did a write, and the file system wanted to make sure that that data was on disk for whatever reason, right? It's potentially, there's potentially no way to do that. I mean, I might be able to tell the cache, don't ever cache this file or something, but it's kind of gross. Here, what I can do is, in the process of doing the write, I can issue commands to the cache to say, you know, flush this data block, right? Like, you can keep this data block in the cache, but I want you to write the contents to disk immediately, right? So, and, and the cons are essentially what, we tr what, what, what the pro was for the, the other approach. We can't see file semantics. All we see is this stream of block IDs, which means it can be very difficult for the cache to provide certain types of performance improvements. So let's say I wanted to do read ahead, right? Read ahead is a pretty common file system operation. It's predicated on what assumption, right? So, so what, what, what do you think is a common access pattern for a lot of files? Particularly things like media. Sequential access, right? When you play an MP3 file, the contents are ordered, right? I mean, why not? They might as well be. They don't have to be. They could, your MP3 file could have its own internal index and it could have stuff all over the place. But, but why do that? That's weird, right? So, I mean, stuff's just laid out in the MP3 file, start to finish. You know, samples that, that correspond to the start of the track or at the beginning and samples that correspond to the end or at the end, right? So when I process that file, when, I, you know, when iTunes reads that file, it starts at the beginning, reads the metadata, and starts processing samples. And essentially, if you look at what it does, it's just reading sequentially over the entire file. If I can detect that, then I can load the future contents, right? So I may watch the first couple of reads, and I may see that a pattern is emerging, and then the file system may start to, to prefetch stuff, right? So it may start to say, hey, you know, I, I know that he just read the fourth block of the file, and, and before that he read the third block, and the second block, and the first block. So when I go get the fourth block, I'm going to get blocks four through ten, right? And then if I see this pattern continuing, I may get larger and larger chunks. Why would I want to get large chunks of the file at once? Ben. In, in, in general, we'll, we'll, and we'll talk about this, I guess we, we didn't talk too much about disk head scheduling. In general, when you're operating, on, when you're, when you're operating with disks, the more, the more operations you can give them at once, the better. Right? So if I have 10 operations to do, right, if I tell the disk one at a time which operation to perform, what's going to happen? And it's going to seek where? It's going to bounce all over the drive, right? Let's say I have 10 random blocks to get, and I tell the, the disk one at a time, get this block, get this block, get this block. So it's just going to go there, go there, and the head's going to be bouncing all over the place, and it's going to be slow, okay? 
Now, let's say I tell the disk, I want all 10 of these blocks. Now what happens? The disk can plan it, and it can probably can do those blocks in one pass, right? So it orders them from the inside to the outside, or vice versa, and it just does all the seeks in one direction, and it gets everything. Right? And actually, we'll, we'll, I have later in the semester planned a kind of a neat case study of, of one technique used on Windows that actually exploits this very property. It's kind of a fun, uh, fun combination of some things from file systems and some things from the memory management layer. It's, it, it's a fun little thing. Okay. So, but below the file system, I mean, th this is essentially what, what modern operating systems do. This is where the cache is implemented. Okay? It's a block, disk block level cache. Right? So now let's talk about consistency. So I've got this caching thing, and the cache is great. Right? And, and I, think, I think I told you guys this last time, but it's too bad we're not doing assignment four because the buffer cache provides this incredible performance improvement. Right? Like when people did assignment four, Normally, it, was, it would really kind of blow them away how much faster file system tests would get once their buffer cache worked, right? At least an order of magnitude, maybe two orders of magnitude, right? It, it really helps. Memory is fast. The disk is slow, okay? What's the problem here, though, for consistency, right? We, we talked about this earlier. What, what, why, why, does the cache, why does the cache matter for consistency? What, what can the cache cause to happen? Ben. Right. So objects in the cache are lost on failures, right? I mean, they're, they're stored in, in volatile memory. So power goes down, those bits are gone. And remember, th th this, is, this, is, you know, this is why this matters, OK? Every, almost every file system operation involves modifying multiple disk blocks. You know, reads, writes, appends, creates, whatever, right? You've got all these on-disk data structures, and I've got to touch the disk in a lot of different places. And if some of those, and, and essentially, on some level, the operation is not complete until all of those operations complete. So you know, if I'm adding a file to a directory, if I'm creating a file and adding it to a directory, until I've made all the necessary modifications and those modifications are actually on disk, that, that, that overall operation is kind of like a database transaction, right? It's not in a consistent state. And so if the cache holds some of these pieces of this operation in, a non, in, in volatile memory, then it's possible that when the power goes out, that you know, I'm going to have a problem reconstructing what was happening, right? So on some level, you know, caching doesn't create this problem, right? If I have to do multiple disk block modifications in order to maintain consistency, I always have a window of time when a power failure can cause an inconsistency to occur. But what caching does is caching can potentially expand that window of time, right? Because as things sit in the cache, I'm, I'm giving a, a bigger target, right, for you know, your little sister or my dog to trip over something and, and, and whack the computer out, right? I'm, I'm giving them a longer time interval when this can happen. Does this make sense? OK. So again, remember, I mean, if I was creating a new file, I had all these different things to do, right? I had to allocate an inode. I had to allocate data blocks. I had to associate the data blocks by modifying the inode. I had, to I had to modify the directory. And then I had to finally write the blocks, right? And then we talked a little bit about what can happen if I get uh, stuck or if something fails at any point here, OK? And I just said this. OK. So right, I, I can leave things in an inconsistent state, and cache and exacerbates the situation by, by giving me a longer time span. All right. So let's, so let's say, OK, you know, I, I've, I've, I've put the fear of, of, you know, uh, of power failures in you, of any sort of failure. And, and now your approach is, I want a consistent file system. What is the safest way to achieve this? Keep flushing buffers, or, or what does this mean? What does this mean from a caching perspective? What should my cache not, never do? Have any ideas? Anybody have an idea? Yeah. Flush the cache. Flush the cache. But what does this mean? What, what do I need to flush? Do not keep the right data. Don't buffer writes. Pretty simple, right? Don't buffer any writes. Just let the writes go straight to disk, right? 
Anytime I make a modification to anything, that modification does not. Now, it may modify the cache, right? Why would I modify the cache even if I'm going to uh, write the data immediately out to disk? So that you don't have to read again. So the reads work, right? Because the next time I read this, I want the data in the cache to be, uh, to be fresh, right? But it, so, so we, there's, a, there's an approach to caching, which is called a write-through cache. It simply means that writes are never buffered in the cache. Right? They, they, they sit there. They, sorry. <laughs> Woo, I'm getting ahead of myself. They go straight to disk. Right? OK, now let's say you're, you, let's say you're like, I don't, I don't care. Oh, man, I keep wanting to use more colloquial and less video appropriate language. Um, so uh, <laughs> let's say you say, I don't care at all about consistency. I just want my file system to be really fast. Now what do I do? What's, what's, what's the other pull? What's the other position in the universe? that you can take here that will maximize performance on some level. And for how long? So you close the file, or I would, I would argue that, that you can, I mean, you can cache all operations until blocks are evicted, meaning they're removed from the cache for whatever reason. Maybe they hasn't been modified for a while, and I need space for something that is actually actively in use. But you know, on some level, you can cache these things until the machine shuts down. Right? I mean, that would be the longest period of time that you could leave things in. Okay? So I think it's clear where the trade-offs are here. Right? The more data I cache, the better things are for performance. The more often I write things to disk, the better things are for safety. Okay? So what about, and, and there, are, there are plenty of middle grounds here. right? So, so what's, what's one middle ground between you know, uh, buffering until things are evicted and writing back immediately. What, what else could I do? What's kind of a, a straightforward approach? Test in between that if you slope the cache, that if the data is the same in the cache and the block. Yeah, you're getting closer. Luke, do you have an idea? No. Ben? Uh, you could actually do both. So you could write through the cache and then once that is So, so in, in general, I want to do that even with the write-through cache, right? Because I want reads to work, right? But, but again, so one, option A, write immediately. Option B, wait as long as possible. What, what, what's the, what's the, what's the trade-off here? What, what's, what's the middle point, John? Yeah, so I, I could definitely be, be, it's similar to what we did with paging, right? I could be writing out dirty cache blocks periodically, or I could just ensure that what? That this is a variation of this. What's that? So, so I'm, still not, I'm still not sure what you mean by this. <laughs> if, if we are getting write calls like byte by byte, we'll wait till the size we want to write becomes Oh, okay, yeah. So I, I could I could wait till a certain number of modifications happen to a block, but what is that a variant of? I'm trying to get at something very maybe too specific for for an in-class question. I can just have a timer, right? I can just have a deadline. I can say the longest I'll let write sit in the cache is X, right? And you know, it, it, with with a minimum interval X, I'm going to make sure that every block in the cache gets flushed to disk, right? So now what I've done is I I have a, a, a kind of a bound. Right? I can tell you, if you make a modification to the file, as long as the machine stays up for 10 seconds, that change will be reflected on disk. Right? So th this is kind of another approach. All right. All right. The other thing, ah, OK. So the, the other thing I can do, which, which a number of file systems do do, is I might not allow metadata to sit in the cache. Because right? this stuff is important. Right? We talked a little bit before about if I forget to, if, if, if a modification to the super block or to one of the disk data structures doesn't make it to disk, that can cause a lot of problems. Right? If some, you know, if some read, that, or sorry, if some write that you do to, you know, your uh, assignment to patch file doesn't make it to disk, who cares? Right? Like, you know, I, I don't know. At some level, the file system will come up, and at least that file will exist. And there won't be some orphan data block somewhere, right? And you'll just have to reconstruct the contents, right? So it's possible that I keep file system metadata structures like the super block, I maps, and bitmap. Those get those get written immediately. Those are right th right through, and everything else is is held in the cache, right? So this can make sure that again the file system data structures are consistent. The file system data may lack, right? 
And then finally, I just want to point out that there is an interface to uh, forcing the file system or asking the file system really to syn synchronize itself, right? And, and uh, there's a Unix uh, system call called sync. There's also them called fsync, right? Sync syncs an entire file system. It says to the file system, please make sure all your stuff is on disk. Now, I guess on, on some file systems, this actually might not do that, right? But you know, you're asking politely, and, and on, some, on some file systems, you would hope that it actually does do that. And then if I want to sync a specific file, I can, I can request that a specific file be, be written to disk right, through a separate command. All right, but let me, let's talk about a little bit of a different approach to consistency. right? So we've been talking here about, uh, I mean, what's, what's, the, what's at the root of our troubles here, right? What is not atomic? So uh, I'm making these modifications and usually involves what, and that's not atomic, right? What, what, what's not atomic from the perspective? System operation is not atomic because they, they work in different parts. So writing multiple disk blocks, right? I mean, that's conceptually not atomic, right? I ask the disk to write a block, and then I have to ask it to write another one and another one, right? What, what potentially might be atomic from the perspective of the disk? Writing one block, right? One disk blocks. Nice. Um, OK, so, so I don't know why I find it so funny. Um, so, so writing a disk block might be atomic, right? And, and how, many, how many people ever read uh, Tom Clancy books? Is it just me? God, I feel so alone. Uh, any, anyway, so uh, one of the main characters, and you guys aren't going to care about this. Who cares? I, I won't tell you who Kathy Ryan is. You can go look it up. Um, but, but on some level, you know, it, when I was a kid and I was reading these books and so enthralled, I thought this, like, you know, th this, she was the first person to say this, right, which is probably false. But you know, one, one, one way of trying to ensure file system consistency is simply to, to obey this maxim. Okay? If you don't write it down, it never happened. Now, that's true, right? I mean, that's, that's our problem, right? And the problem is that certain things aren't getting written down to the disk. But the question is, can I keep a more compact representation of things that allows me to record what operations I did and didn't do? Okay? And this approach is known as journaling. Right? And journaling is a modern file system technique. It's in use by a lot of file systems. And the approach is actually quite simple. Okay? I maintain a special data structure on disk that's called the journal. When I make changes to the disk, I write the changes that I'm going to make in the journal. Right? I, I essentially, the first thing I do is I tell the journal what I'm about to do. Right? And then when I get around to actually doing it, right, and that may be delayed by caching or other things, I mark those things as completed in the journal. If I fail, I load, when I load the file system, I open up the journal file and I look in there and I try to see what things hadn't I done yet. Hadn't I done yet? That's also not grammatically correct. I'm getting tired. Um, what, what things had I not done yet? That still doesn't sound right, but it's the best I can do. Um, and, and I try to redo those operations, right? So I can use that information to, to figure out what needs to be done, okay? So, so, let's, so let's make an example of this, right? And here's my little, like, dear diary sort of. <laughs> Clearly, this is not what you would write in the journal, right? But, but, but this is what it would mean, OK? So let's say I'm going to create a file. What do I need to do, right? So I say, dear journal, this is what I'm about to do, right? Or here's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to allocate this inode, right? And I, and I put down the inode number, right? I'm going to uh, associate these data blocks with this new file, right? And then I'm going to add this file to a certain directory, right? to the directory with inode whatever. Okay? So I, I mark this in the journal, and then I say, that's it. That's one operation. Okay? So now the question is, let's say that I wrote that down in the journal, and then some time went by. And finally, all of those, data, all those blocks that were involved with this, block 567, blocks 55, 87, 98, and, and 33, so what happens when they're flushed to disk? What do I do to the journal? What's that? You throw it out. Well, uh, yeah, I, I, I mark that, the, that I did it, right? I say, hey, I'm, I'm finished with these things, right? And on some level, when, when file system data structures get flushed to disk, we mark that in the journal as what's called a checkpoint, right? A checkpoint means that the journal up to that point is now consistent with things on disk, OK? 
Why do I, why do I mark this? What am I going to use this checkpoint for? When I replay, right? So when a failure occurs, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the last checkpoint and work forward. Right? So let's say I had a, a catastrophic failure and the, the machine starts up again, right? And here's what I find in the journal. So I've got this message here that says above, which you don't see, I had you know, essentially written all this to disk, right? So this is a checkpoint. And I have a nice horizontal rule in there to show you what. Um, and then I have this entry in my journal. I say, here's what I was going to do today. Allocate the side note. So again, I'm creating this file, and, and this is what I find in the journal. So now, what do I need to do on recovery? I need to replay this. Specifically, I need to go through operation by operation and see if these things have actually happened. It's possible that some of these writes actually made it to disk, right? Not all of them were guaranteed to make it to disk, so what I can do, I can look on the disk and I can see, okay, inode 567 is already allocated. Okay, so that means that I had got around to doing that, right? What do I do with the next entry? What do I need to do with this entry? What's that? I need to look at the blocks that are associated with inode 567 and make sure that these data blocks are actually linked in. Right? And it's possible that in this case, I hadn't made the modifications to the inode yet. And so I need to associate these blocks with the file. Right? And of course, I would have to put down exactly which part of the file that they were, they were storing right? so I could associate them properly. And then finally, what do I do with the next entry? Right? It says that inode 567 should be, in, should be in the directory with inode 33. So how do, I, how do I check the rest of this entry? What's that? You don't need to check, right? I mean, because that one didn't happen, so you just start doing everything after that. Well, no, no, no. It, so it's, it's possible that things, I, I'm pretty sure it's possible in this case, that things can actually, these things can happen in, in different orders, right? That, that's something that I could support. So it's possible that I actually did number two, but didn't do one and three. Right. There's no requirement that these things happen in order. Because of caching, they might happen in, 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 in different orders. Right. All a checkpoint ensures that everything up to that point happened. Right. That, that's, a, that's sort of a guarantee. Right. So what do I need to do with this last entry? Malik. Not sure. OK, so I need to read inode 33, and I need to figure out, you know, is is inode 567 in this directory, right? And I would have to have a path in here too, right? So I'd have to know what's the path name that I was adding this, this inode to the directory for, okay? And then I'm done, right? So if this is all that's in the, in the journal, then when I, I boot the system up, I replay the journal, and now I can essentially produce a new checkpoint here indicating that all the on-disk data structures are up to date, okay? So what do I do with an incomplete, this is the last thing we'll do today, what do I do with an incomplete entry. Let's say that this is all that ended up in the journal. What, 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 what do I have to do here? What's that? I can't do this, right? I essentially just have to toss out these changes, right? Meaning that if there's an incomplete journal entry, and, and why do I have to do that? Why do I have to throw this out, right? What would happen if I actually process the state? I would leave the file system in an inconsistent state, and I meant to have an answer to this question, right? But yeah, I would essentially, you know, I, I might have, uh, what, what would happen here, right? I would have an inode, I would have a file that's not in a directory, right? So that would be not good. Right? I like to have files in directories so I can find them, right? So if, if I process these, and, and that's why I need to have a start of the commit message and an end of that message in the journal, okay? So, so let, me, let me just get through this. This is the last slide, OK? So the ni what's the nice thing about journaling? On some level, it, it seems like I've just pulled some sort of a parlor trick on you, right? I told you that I have to make these multiple operations to disk box, and now I've got to make multiple operations to the journal, OK? So what's different here? It's right up on the slide. So, so the metadata updates, I, I can represent them <laughs> Calvin got part of the answer, but not the part I was looking for. Uh, I can represent them compactly, and so I can write them quickly and atomically to the journal, right? So writing down that I was going to allocate inode 567 to the journal, 
doesn't, you know, doesn't require touching the actual inode bitmap data structure, right? What, what about data blocks, right? So I've got data blocks that I might have changed, right? What are the two things that I can do with data blocks? So data blocks are different because with a data block, I've actually got a whole block of data, right? So one approach is that I can put them in the journal. This kind of is, is stinky, right? It's, it's, it's kind of stinks because it means that eventually that data block is going to be written again to the actual data block on disk, and so it's going to be written twice. The other option is I can exclude them from the journal, right? Meaning simply that the on-disk data structures will be um, up to date, they will be consistent, but some of the data for files may be missing. This, this is similar to the approach where I was always writing through my, my uh, bitmaps and things like that to the disk, right? So it's possible that I'll lose some file contents, but not file data. Sorry, I'll lose some file data, but I won't lose the structure of the file system, right? I won't have blocks that are marked allocated that I can't find or, you know, files that aren't included in any directory. All right, we're done. On Wednesday, we're going to talk about, I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, on Wednesday, we're going to talk about FFS, right? So FFS was a, uh, an early file system design, did a lot with the geometry of the disk, and will be a good kind of case study for us to learn about uh, how some of disk layout considerations were taken into effect.